If you're new here, my name is Verge. I'm the pastor at Vertical Church together with my lovely wife, Pastor Jesus Len. We got to preach together yes, today, everybody. My favorite. We're preaching together. So proud of you guys. Made it with the, with the daylight savings time. Yeah. Good job, everyone. Thank you, Jesus. Um, <clears throat> I just want to take a moment to say something because uh, sometimes some of you might not know. I'm in love with this woman, all right? She's my girl. And I really want to say that I love preaching with her. I was telling her today, uh, when we get to preach together, there's something beautiful about it. And uh, you make my preaching better. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's Brownie how points, it's done, Brownie gentlemen. Points. Good job. Good um, job. <laughs> thank you. It's good to be here, everybody. Welcome, uh, welcome home. And if you're new, we're happy that you're here to worship with us. Um, we are currently in the middle of a series entitled Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And the Lord brought us on this journey uh, for, since last year as pastors to really help our congregation understand what spiritual maturity is. And the premise of this curriculum, it's actually a book by Pastor Peter Scazzaro called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. The premise is that it's impossible to be spiritually mature and remain emotionally immature. And the reason this is important is because a lot of people, a lot of Christians, and we've said this before, there are people who have been going to church for 20 years, they've been a Christian, but they're not a 20-year-old Christian, they're a one-year-old Christian 20 times. Because there's no depth, there's no spiritual maturity. Now, I'm not, we're not saying this to make anybody feel bad, we're just saying it because if we understand it, we can do something about it. Can I get an amen? amen? And there's a lot more Christians in diapers in church than we think. And sometimes we got to look in the mirror. <laughs> Why? 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 Because sometimes we haven't been taught how to be emotionally healthy, which is a direct correlator to spiritual maturity. And, uh, and this, this has been on our hearts by the way, our heart for this year is discipleship. Right. Everything we're talking about is how, how do we, re we raise disciple makers? So, so how do we raise disciples who make disciples who make disciples? Because that's the Great Commission. That's right. Matthew 28, 19. And I find that we have a lot of Christians, but few disciples. We have a lot of people in the multitudes, but there's few in the inner circle. And it's not because they can't be there. It's because there's a cost. And it requires spiritual maturity. How have you felt in this series? Um, yeah, it's definitely been so encouraging for me. I'm, for me personally, it's been challenging. It's been an opportunity for me to examine my heart and my yeah. walk with the Lord. But I'm so excited that we as a church are walking through this together because I think it, it's important for us to be self-aware, right? To be aware of where we are. Yeah. How is our emotional health? How is our spiritual maturity? Where are we at? Am I maturing? Am <clears> I taking <throat> next steps? Or do I find myself kind of hitting the same wall, right? Um, where is my identity place? I thought that was such a, like, I think honestly every single message in the yeah. series is so important. Um, and I want to mention, you know, we want to help everyone out. Mm -hmm. So there is actually a resource where you can take the emotionally... Uh, a survey. Survey, but how, what is it called? Emotionally healthy. Emotionally healthy spirituality. You can take the survey. It's free. It's maybe like 15, 20 minutes. So we're going to give you the QR code QR so you can code. scan it. Um, and you can just take it on your own time. We're giving you pastoral permission to take your phone out in the service. Yes. Go ahead. Take your phones out. For 30 seconds. Scan Cameras that are watching QR you. code. Anybody but know what QR stands for? Quick response. Quick response. Quick Very response. good. Quick, Quick response. response. QR good code. Job. Yes. Somebody learned something new today. <laughs> so you can have that open on your phone. Do not take the assessment yeah. now. Don't okay? do it while you're here. No. Keep like it there. The idea is after. And by, by the way, what, what this is going to tell you, if you're honest in your answers, if you are a, an emotional infant, baby, mm -hmm. emotional child, emotional adolescent, emotional adult, why, yeah. why, we want to help you on this journey. Yeah. We've had a few people tell us. I'm an emotional baby, right? right. Like, but but I, it's good because now they exactly. can take steps. We know where we're at. It's important for us to know where we're at and accept it and say, okay, what can I do? God, help me so I can continue growing and maturing. And so I think that this series is yeah. so important for that. I, and I was thinking even just this day, giving you a little bit of a window into the life of a pastor. We as pastors and leaders in the church, we experience so many emotions with different people at the same time. Uh, on Friday, we were at, uh, I was at a funeral service with uh, someone who lost a very dear loved one. And then Saturday morning, we were here with five families who were dedicating their babies. 
And then yesterday afternoon in Port St. Lucie, I was officiating a wedding for somebody from our church that got married. And so we're crying in one moment, but then we're celebrating in another. And this is, this is the reality of our emotions. It's the reality of the life we're in. And speaking of the, of the, of the wedding, can you guys imagine as, as the officiant, if I would have said to the two that were getting married, if I said, hey, Hey, so and so and so. So I just want to tell you, today you get married, and from now on, your life is going to be easy and perfect. Happily ever after, right? <laughs> what would you guys think if I said that to them? Woo, that pastor's lying. <laughs> but you, th- that would be a very immature statement with a very superficial explanation. Because the truth is not that. And so, so what about churches and pastors that all they say is, your life is going to be great. You're going to be a millionaire, and you're never going to have an issue again. And then a lot of people like that. Amen. That's what I want to hear. This is the type of preaching I like. Mm-hmm. And then a problem comes, and guess what's exposed? Shallow, immature spirituality. Because, oh, I thought... I thought God was with me. God, I thought you were with me. You're going to allow this? Forget you and back to the world. And now we blame God or we blame others because we don't have emotional health and much less spiritual maturity. Right. So today's message is entitled Dealing with Grief and Loss. This is message five so far in this series. And I want to invite everybody, if you have your Bibles, Go to Matthew 26. That's going to be our main passage today. We're going to have other verses. We'll put those on the screens. If you're taking notes, write them down. But take out your sword. Go to Matthew 26. That's where we're going to be most of the time throughout. We're going to go back and forth, back to Matthew 26. Before we get there, let me start off with this statement. Grief and loss are a part of this life. Grief and loss are a part of this life. This connects with last week's message when we talked about journeying through the wall. Mm. Remember that one? that we all will walk through hard walls in life. We will all experience dark souls of the night. It's not because we want to. It's because we live on this side of heaven. Right. Sometimes we experience loss in unexpected and exaggerated ways, like Job in the Bible who lost everything in one day. Mm -hmm. But most of us, we experience losses more slowly and over the span of a lifetime. Loss is inevitable Now, there's different types of losses. Let me give you the first list, and then uh, just later we'll give you the second one. Some losses sometimes occur unexpectedly from catastrophic events. For example, if you see this list here, loss of employment when that's what you depend on and it was unexpected, boom, you're out of a job. That's, That's a shocker, right? Loss of marriage, whether it's because of infidelity, divorce, or the death of a spouse. Loss of loved ones family members, friends, miscarriages, infertility, loss of health, maybe an unexpected diagnosis or sickness that came out of left field, the betrayal of a loyal friend that you never would have thought just stabs you in the back, the loss of a home. You know, we talked about that hurricane that hit the west coast of Florida last year and there was a hurricane an earthquake. In, uh, uh, an earthquake, earthquake I'm sorry. Turkey. Mm-hmm. In Turkey. All these things happening, people losing things. A child born with severe handicap. Man, that's, it's, it feels like a catastrophic loss. You have to grieve that. Mm-hmm. These come that way. There's other ones. Yeah, so there's other times where losses come in maybe a more natural or more expected ways. And we're giving you guys this list to just give you a few examples because sometimes we don't categorize these moments in our lives as moments loss. of grief or loss. Mm-hmm. And so we want to help you identify that. So some, there are some natural ways or expected ways. And so as you can see on the list, the first one is loss of youth, right? Sometimes you, you, hit, you hear of people experiencing <clears throat> like a middle-aged crisis or a certain, they get to a certain point in their life and they're just grieving the fact that they're no longer, you know, in their teenage years or in their 20s, right? So sometimes that is a, a loss you have to experience. Uh, lost dreams, Right? Sometimes you have certain dreams or goals or expectations, and sometimes they don't happen as you expected or when you expected. Um, loss of your home city or country. Maybe you move to a new city, 
that you don't know anyone at, or maybe I think even uh, maybe even harder is when you immigrate to a new country where you leave your language, your culture, you know, your community. But any type of big move uh, is really there's a loss there, right? There's a loss, and we have to recognize <clears throat> that loss of former friendships for many different reasons, loss of influence, right? Maybe as a parent, you don't have that same voice of influence over your children when they're getting older, when they're young adults and they're adults. And before, you know, your voice had a bigger, like more weight to it. And so that loss of influence can be very hard. Or maybe you had a certain title or position in a, in a certain company or job that you had, you had certain influence and then you, you've lost that influence maybe for whatever reason. That can also uh, cause uh, that same feeling. We all face suffering, loss, and pain in this life. The issue is, when we're faced with it, most of us try to escape. And the problem with our culture and our society nowadays is that we have a hard time dealing with grief and loss. We feel like it's strange. Sometimes we feel even guilty. Why am I feeling this way? Especially if we're Christians, because shouldn't we be joyful all the time and always be happy? And, and, and we have no idea sometimes how to respond to it or what to do with it. So most of the time, we try to avoid pain and grief at all costs. And we resort to strategies that we don't, we don't try, but we just naturally go into denial. And sometimes we just deny something. We just deny that even happens, it's right there. Sometimes we fall into blaming others. Sometimes we minimize, where we say, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. But really, man, I'm not fine. And we try to minimize it superficially, rationalize it. Or even more common, we try to mask our pain with addiction. So we overwork, we overeat, we overdrink, we overshop, we overindulge. That's how we get to things like pornography and addictions, drugs, alcohol, smoking, anything that will stop the pain, anything that will mask what I'm feeling so I don't have to deal with it. By the way, the whole iceberg model is something that we've talked about in this series because the iceberg, normally you only see the top 10% that's above the surface, but there's 90% of the of the iceberg that's beneath the surface. And a lot of us are good at dealing with the top because that's what people see. Right. But, the, but what's underneath the surface is untouched by Jesus because it takes courage and it's hard to deal with that. And so we're not taught how to grieve well. Most of our families didn't teach us how to grieve and how to deal with pain and loss. There's no, I don't remember taking a college course on this. And even in church sometimes, we don't talk about this aspect as much as we should. And, and as Christians, we might even think, are we, am I allowed to be sad? Right. And so here's the big idea of today's message. Big idea in one sentence, big idea of this message. God will use grief and loss to grow you and to mature you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reality is that this is part of discipleship. This is part of spiritual maturity. And it might not be a popular topic, right, in many churches today, but it is a very significant topic in the Bible. The Bible has a lot to say about yeah. grief and loss. There are 35 chapters in the book of Job that describe all of the anguish, the anger, even the, the suicidal thoughts that Job faces because of the amount of grief and loss he is experiencing, the amount of pain he's experiencing. Two-thirds of the book of Psalms are laments or even complaints to God. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us that there's a time for everything under the sun, mm -hmm. right? There's a time to laugh, but there's a time to weep. There's a time to cry, a time to mourn. There's an entire book in the Bible in the Old Testament called the book of Lamentations. Lamentations. Okay? And Jesus himself prayed with loud cries and tears. We're going to talk about that today. This is part of our spiritual life. We cannot ignore it. We cannot try to suppress it or hide it or even reject it. Look at what Psalm 34, 18 says. It says, the Lord is close mm. to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Mm. That verse is in the Bible for a reason, by the way. If that verse is there, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, that means that sometimes we're going to go through heartbreak. Yeah. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit because sometimes we will go through experiences that feel like they're crushing us. Yeah. Can we take a moment? Can we just pray? Can we ask the Holy Spirit to minister to us today? Lord, we come before you asking you to minister to our hearts. Every, 
man, woman, every young person, every person connected online and here in this building. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would speak to us, that we would understand. I pray for the youngest middle schooler in this place, that they would be attentive and receptive to this message. And I pray for the most mature elder in our, in our audience today, that every one of us would receive what you have so that we could learn, and no matter what age we are, or no matter how long we've been following Christ, we can grow and mature in a way that is pleasing and healthy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Let's talk about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You can start opening up to Matthew 26 if you have it separated there. You know, it's, it's exciting to join Jesus if we're going to walk on water. Anybody want to sign up for that one? Yeah. <laughs> it's exciting to join Jesus when he's going to do miracles, like the multiplication of the loaves and the fish. Like that's, sign me up. Fish sandwich, baby. I'm hungry. <laughs> but not many people are signing up for the Garden of Gethsemane field trip. Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. Everybody say Gethsemane. Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here, guys, while I go over there and pray. But he took Peter... And the two sons of Zebedee along with him. Anybody know the two sons of Zebedee? James, James and John. John. And he be, so he took Peter, James, and John. And he began to sorrowful, to be sorrowful and troubled. Pause. What did Jesus begin, begin to be? Sorrowful and what? Troubled. troubled. What did he begin to be? What, what, what? Sorrowful. sorrowful and troubled. Who was sorrowful and troubled? Jesus. Jesus. Did you know that? He was sorrowful and troubled. Another version says, afflicted. Then he said to them, verse 38, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Are you listening to Jesus' words? My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Have you ever been overwhelmed with sorrow? Have you ever been overwhelmed with sorrow where you felt like, I don't know. I don't know if I could keep on. Jesus is extremely distressed. But, but here, here's a lesson. He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't suppress it. He chooses to pay attention to it. So we're going to talk to you today. Three phases of biblical grieving. Come on, take some notes for you and to share with somebody this week. Three phases of biblical grieving. We're going to follow Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Phase one, pay attention to your grief and loss. Come on, give somebody an elbow, say pay attention. Say pay attention. Pay attention to grief and loss. We have such a hard time truly expressing certain emotions. By the way, especially anger, sadness, impatience, and depression. We have a hard time admitting it, accepting it, and expressing it. In fact, we prefer to act like nothing is wrong. Because we don't know how to deal with these feelings, with these emotions. They're uncomfortable. And so what do we do? More than, most of the time, a lot of us, we stuff them, we bottle them up, and we hold them in. But we have to resist the temptation to do this, and we have to learn from Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, who didn't ignore the grief that he was going through. And so I want to share with you three things that we see here in this scripture that Jesus brings to the Garden. Yeah. You guys ready? Yeah. Number one, Jesus brings his pain. Come on. Jesus brings his pain. Mm -hmm. You know, I think sometimes even as Christians, this might be even harder because, again, we feel that we shouldn't be feeling this way. Like, yeah. we should be, you know, strong, joyful. We're more than conquerors. You know, we have the victory. So I shouldn't really be feeling the pain that I'm feeling or the sadness or the anguish that I'm feeling, right? But we see that Jesus, God in the flesh, recognizes and accepts that he is going through a moment of yeah. pain and an anguish and he brings his pain to mm -hmm. the garden. He experiences this loss, this, this anguish, all of these feelings. He allows himself to experience this pain. And I think that this is an example for us, right? That we can bring our pain to the Father. Yeah, it's good we word. can come to him and, be, and admit it and recognize, mm -hmm. you know, I am going through a hard moment. I'm going through a time of, of, of loss. I'm going through a time of pain. In 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, cast all your anxiety on him. Not some. All. All of your anxiety on him. On who? On God. Yeah. Because he cares for you. That's good. God cares for you. 
And he, he wants us to come to him and cast and give him our mm. anxiety, give him our pain. So number two, we also see that Jesus brings his people. Yeah. Jesus brings his people. By the way, this, this is all on pay attention to your grief and loss. Yeah. Mm. And so this is an example to us that we're not supposed to journey through this pain and grief and loss alone. We need people in our lives, the right people in our lives that are going to be there for us, that are going to support us, that people that we can trust, that we can be honest with, that are not going to sit and judge us or condemn <clears throat> us, but are going to pray with us, have compassion and mercy and grace. They're going to lift us up. And this is, you know, Jesus shares with his disciples. Notice that all 12 of them didn't come. It wasn't all 12 disciples. It was just three, his closest three. And he shares with them and tells them how he feels. He doesn't yeah. try to hide it. And I don't know if th sometimes that may happen with you, but sometimes I feel that I don't want to share what I'm going through because I don't want to burden anybody else. Like everybody has their mm. own issues and situations, so let me just not really share with them because, you know, I don't want to be a burden to someone else. But there, it is important for all of us to have those people in our lives where we can be honest and say, you know what, I'm not having a good day. You know what, today is rough. I need, I need prayer. I need encouragement. Mm. And, we need, and sometimes we need each other. So three things that Jesus brings, his pain, his people, and number three, Jesus brings his prayers. Yeah. He prayerfully processes his pain with the Father. We see this throughout Jesus' life. He is such a beautiful example and model of what a relationship, what a vertical relationship <laughs> is with the Father. Again, he doesn't hold it in. He expresses it to the Father. Mm -hmm. He speaks out. He, the Bible says he cries out to the Father. It wasn't like a little prayer, like, Lord, right now I'm coming before you because I'm experiencing grief and loss. Like, no, he cried out to the Father. Yeah. The Bible expresses, it shows us here, that there was tears. I mean, there was anguish. We're going to read on in a few verses. He was on the floor. Like, mm. it was, he didn't, he didn't fear expressing everything he was feeling, but he does it's it real. through prayer. Through communion, through prayer is how we talk to God. And so he was able to talk to God, not in a religious way, not I'm not going to say these things, I'm going to follow these steps. No, I'm just going to come to God. I'm going to tell him everything yeah. that I'm going through. Look what Psalm 18, 6 says. It says, in my distress, I call to the Lord. I cry to my God for help. Yeah. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. Mm. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. That our God loves us so much that he listens to our cries and our distress. From his holy temple, he hears our voice. He cares for us. And so I want to ask you, I want you to consider, when was the last time that you told God you were sad? When was the last time that you were honest before God and said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed, I'm feeling pain. I'm feeling betrayal or whatever it is that you're feeling. When was the last time you, sh you shared with God how you were feeling? When was the last time you shed some tears before the Father in prayer? It's important. It's part of our healing process. He can handle it, but it's important that we pay attention to it. It's important that we pay attention to it and not deny it. I feel in my heart that I want to apologize on behalf of any pastor or Christian, whoever made you feel bad for feeling bad. If anybody ever kind of came up to you like, well, get over it and just pray. I'm sorry, that's not right. If anybody kind of came with this holy, suck it up buttercup kind of attitude, that's not biblical. And I'm sorry if anybody ever did that to you. May the Lord heal that. May the Lord heal that. When, when we don't process before God the emotions that make us humans, we leak. Everybody say we leak. We leak. Leak is when, when we stuff down emotions down deep and we bottle them up. Those same emotions, they have a way of coming out. They leak. Not because we want them to, but because they're in there and we're not letting them out. They leak through passive aggressive behavior. They leak through sarcastic remarks. They leak through nasty tones. They leak through giving the silent treatment for days or weeks or months or years because they're just bottled up and we don't process them. You know, confessions of a pastor, I'll admit sometimes I'm going through something or I'm, something's 
affecting me and it's, and it's hard and I'll try to bottle it up because I got to be strong, right? And then at home, maybe some little argument sparks between us two and, oh, it leaks. It's not her fault. Or, or the kid, one of my kids does something and very innocently or very, you know, it's a little thing, but all of a sudden my response, whoa, because I leak. And, and it's so this first phase of dealing biblically with grief is so important. We've got to pay attention to it. We have to admit it because when we do so, we can now process it in prayer with the Father, which means it's no longer bottled up in here so I don't have to leak or explode. Yeah. Because I'm releasing it. Right. Phase one. That leads us to phase two. Phase two is wait in the confusing in between. <laughs> so first I got to pay attention to it, bring it to God, and then I got to wait. Loss, loss and grief forces to wait. By the way, waiting isn't easy. Who woke up this morning and said, I feel like waiting today? <laughs> Come on, let's go to public. Let's wait in line, baby. Come on, where's this? I need a street light with a lot of cars. Come on. I want to wait today. Anybody? <laughs> I want to wait for the Wi-Fi to connect. Come on, 10 minutes at least. Nobody likes that because we don't like waiting. And that's why this part is hard in the phase of grieving because it's the, the confusing in between is when you're in a time of grieving and things don't make sense. Yeah. I'm hurting. It's painful. And it doesn't even make sense. I don't know when I'm going to get out of it. I don't know who's going to help me. I don't even know why I'm here. It's the confusing in between. And so in these times of pain or suffering, we're tempted not to wait. We're tempted to find an explanation or someone to blame, especially God, by the way. I thought you were with me, and you're going to allow this to happen? Psh, I'm out of here. Church, I ain't going to church. I ain't no God. And, and, and we start blaming the one who could help us, or we start blaming people. And we start running from God and our sorrows during the seasons of the confusing in between. If we, if we don't do that, it doesn't heal. It gets worse. And so to grow up, we have to walk through the valley. We have to walk through the walls towards Jesus, even if we can't see him. Yeah. And I think we're talking about this waiting and this confusion, confusing in between. And so just to clarify, this confusing in between is from the moment the loss or the pain happens, the offense or whatever the situation is, that moment happens to the moment where you're past it, you're healed, you're mm. whole. So that in between, yeah. it takes time, right? We're talking about that weight in that moment. And I think it's so difficult because we can't see it with our physical eyes, right? We can't see it. And so I think, think about it with our physical bodies. If you have an accident, right, they, the doctors, they give you an idea of how long this process mm -hmm. of healing and recovery is going to be. You know, you broke your arm, so now we're going to have to, you know, put a cast on or we have to go through surgery, and then now we're going to have to go through a process of rehab, and there's going to be six months of this. So then you kind of prepare yourself and you see the process, so it's a little bit easier to understand, <laughs> but it's more confusing when it has to do with our souls because yeah. we don't see it, right? We can't see it, so we don't know how process, how long this process is going to be. And so we want to talk about three things to do as you wait. Yeah. Trust Jesus, surrender to Jesus, and listen to Jesus. Let's go with the first one. So again, we're in this process of waiting. If you find yourself here, there's three things we want you to, to remember. A, trust Jesus. Yeah. Wait on him to transform your heart. Mm. When you're trusting in him, it means that we put our faith and our trust in Jesus. Not in a person, not in a system, not in... Anything else in money, in possession, nothing. Like we're putting our trust mm -hmm. in Jesus. You know, at one point, the disciples asked Jesus, you know, what does God want us to do? Is it praying? Is it serving? Because sometimes that's what happens. We want to do things. And even if they look like good things, they're not even necessarily bad things. We just want to do because when we're doing, we don't, we're not waiting and being still before the Lord and experiencing the pain. So we want to keep ourselves busy right? Because it kind of helps us forget, mm -hmm. right? What the season that we're in, us. it distracts us. Look what Jesus uh, responds on in John 6 verses 28 to 29. It says, they replied, we want to perform God's work too. What should we do? And Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Mm. That is what God wants us to do, to believe in yeah. Jesus, yeah. to put our trust in him, and this is something that we have to do daily. And sometimes it might even feel like every minute, 
depending on the situation we're in. So, so the second one is surrender to Jesus. This one's hard. We, surrender means release. It means give. It means give up. Surrender the unknown in this confusing in-between. It means that I release my own desired expectations in the process. I have to surrender it. Can anybody understand me that this is hard? <laughs> it's hard to surrender yeah. because we tend to attach ourselves to our own will and our own desires. And so, and so we see Jesus go th through this in the garden. Let's go back to Matthew 26, right? This is the main passage. Uh, back in your Bibles, Matthew 26, jump to verse 39. We see Jesus actually detach himself from his own outcome and accept the Father's will. He says, verse 39, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. This is how Jesus is having this moment of, of anguish and prayer with God. His face is on the ground in, in the Garden of Gethsemane. My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. It's not, it's not this cup, okay? This cup means this situation, this circumstance and suffering that I'm currently drinking. Father, is, is, there, is there any possibility that we cannot do this? Because at this time, one of his best friends is betraying him. At this time, he's already aware of the cross which is approaching, the physical torture, the emotional anguish. And, and Jesus is saying, Father, 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 Father. Father, is there any ways or any other ways or any other way? This wasn't too long. We read it in, in seven seconds, but this wasn't seven seconds. Right. This is anguish. This is hours. By the way, this is days where he's carrying what he knows is coming. And he's like, Father, can you take this cup from me? And at some point in the process, because it wasn't seconds, I'll assure you that at some point in the process, he gets to the point where he says, yet, yet not as I will, Father, not my will. Your will be done. There's a pause between those two statements. There's time. And Jesus moves from struggling to accept the Father's no to rising up to embrace the Father's will. And, and translation, what Jesus was saying, Father, if this is your will for my life, it's hard, but I will accept it. Let it be done. And he's learning to obey the Father and accept his will, even though it means his suffering. Talk about, matru talk about maturity. Hmm. Talk about maturity. This isn't easy. And this takes time. Sometimes days. Sometimes weeks. Sometimes months. Sometimes years. To do what, Pastor? Here's a line. To transition from asking God to change your situation to asking God to change your heart. Yeah. Because our first instinct is, God, take it away. God, remove it. God, do this for me. And, and we're so stuck there that when he doesn't do it, then we're like, what's your problem? God doesn't hear. He's, in, he's not with me. Immaturity. Maturity? God, if you could take it away, man, that would be great. If you could take this cup from me. Change my heart. And here's the prayer. Here it is. Here's the prayer you put on the screen. God, I want what you want, even if it's not what I want. Mm. That's the prayer of a mature Christian. Mm -hmm. Immature. I want what I want. I want what I want. And if I don't get what I want, I ain't going back to church. Are you seeing it? All those people out there. I know, I know it's not you. It's all those people out there. All right. We're talking about how we, pro how, what do we do when we're in this waiting, this confusing between? And the mm. last tip we want to give you is to listen to Jesus. Mm. Right? And I think a lot of these points, you, they may seem like obvious, right? Oh, of course, trust in Jesus, surrender to Jesus, listen to Jesus, obviously, right? But how hard is it when we're in this <laughs> moment, in these moments of our lives, when we're in this moment of waiting? And I think the reality mm. is that we say we want God's help, right? But the truth is we really want to be in charge. Yeah. I want to be in control. I want, I want God to tell me, okay, God, fine. I'll go through this process. This is painful, but tell me how you're going to fix it, how you're going to work on me. What is the outcome? Show me what it is, and then I'm going to listen to you, right? 
We want to be in control. But that's not surrender. That is not trusting in him, mm. right? That, that's not us putting our faith in him. And so when we follow Jesus, it's not so much about doing things for him. It really consists of taking the time to listening to him. Mm. And part of the key of listening to Jesus is sitting at the feet of Jesus and not doing anything else. Sitting to him to be able to stop all the noise, because believe me, this is a very noisy, noisy world we're living in. Mm. The volume of everything is loud. It's blasting, right, in, from every direction. And so we have to be intentional to say, I'm going to turn that volume down, and I'm going to sit at the feet of Jesus. I'm going to open his word. I'm going I'm to listen to him. What is he saying to me, mm. right? And so that is part of waiting. We need to stop and listen, because Grieving takes time. Grieving takes, takes time. time. Matthew 26, we're continuing on with Jesus here in the Garden of Gethsemane. We're going to continue from verse 40 to 42. It says, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. <laughs> Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? Mm. He asked Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh, flesh is, is weak. weak. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will mm. be done. Wow. Mm. You know, I think it's important for us to understand that the deeper the loss, the more time you're going to need. Yeah. Okay? Again, I think of, I, I, I compare things sometimes in the physical body because we're able to understand it more. But if I get a paper cut, it's a very different time of healing than if I fracture my femur, right? Or if I fracture a bone. Mm. If I get a paper cut, I'd probably be fine in a few hours, right? Put a Band-Aid and move on. You can't but put a Band-Aid on a You're on not going to put a Band-Aid <laughs> on a broken bone. And I understand in the physical that it's going to take, of course, you just fractured your bone. You, you're going to have to go through mm. a process of healing. There's going to be, like, we have grace for that. But sometimes we don't have grace for that and understanding for that when it comes to our emotions, when it comes to our soul. Yeah. And so we think that we've gone, we've, we've gone through a loss, but then we just kind of want to move quickly through it. We don't want to wait and allow the healing to take place. It's very different. I'll give you another example. There is actual loss and pain that you as a parent may feel when one of your kids moves away, maybe goes to college. That's a loss, mm -hmm. and you're, it's, it's okay to grieve that. You know, it's a different season, and things have changed. But it's a very different loss than, it, than the experience and pain if your child were to die tragically. They're both loss, but they're very different. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Paper yeah. cut to a broken bone. And so the important thing is not to minimize it. Not, just because I have a paper cut doesn't mean that, oh, well, I didn't break my bones, so I'll get it. No, it's okay. It hurts to get a paper cut. And the same thing, maybe I was offended or some, something happened at work or something happened with a friend. Let's not minimize it. Let's, let's allow for the pay process. Attention pay attention to it. to it. But understand that there's going to be a process of, of healing and <clears throat> understanding that we can't censor it, right? We, have to, we can't rush the process. Again, nobody likes that process of pain, but grieving takes time. And we see this in the life of Jesus. He modeled this for us. And in biblical grieving, it leads, it leads us to phase three, the final phase, right? which is where we let the old birth the new. And this is where there's breakthrough. And it's hard to understand this, but great gifts await us on the other side of loss and grief. Pastor, are you sure about that? I, yeah. If we wait yeah. on him. This third phase is about transitioning to something new by understanding that endings are always a gateway to new beginnings. Amen. And G by the way, Jesus' time here on the earth came to an end. However, his death was not final. That's right. He eventually died on the cross to pay the price for our sins, the sins of all the world. But three days later, what happened? He resurrected. And through the death of Jesus, God birthed something new where now all of us, the rest of humanity, can now have personal relationship with the Father because Amen. of what Jesus did on the cross. Amen. A new beginning for all of us to possibly be restored into a loving relationship with the Father. So embracing endings is important. And, and in the Bible, we learn this. Here's a really good point to remember. The way to life is through death, 
and the pathway to resurrection is through crucifixion. Hmm. And if we allow God to let the old birth the new in his time and in his way, even though it hurts in the moment, we'll be blessed. There's a lot of deaths in this life. There's a lot of loss. But when we embrace the losses and the journey through biblical grieving like Jesus did, we begin to, check this out, we begin to move from an immature, shallow prayer, which is gimme, gimme, gimme. I want, I want, I want. Me, me, me. Immature, shallow prayer. We transition to a mature prayer that says, God, I want what you want, even if it's not what I want. Yeah. Not my will, Lord. Your will be done. Amen. I don't get it. I don't like it, but I trust you. I trust you. And we're able to understand God better. And that su suffering actually brings transformation. That's right. And remember, the resurrection can only come after the crucifixion. I like this verse in John 12, 24. It's up on the screens here. It says, I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Let the old birth the new. Embrace an ending so that God can make space for a new beginning. Remember, on the other side of the cross is resurrection. So, so those are the phases of grieving. A, pay attention to grief and loss. B, wait in the confusing in between. And eventually it'll lead you to a place where you can let the old birth the new. That's right. And so we want to finish this message sharing this um, beautiful illustration that we don't believe is a coincidence. Um, Jesus was pressed in the garden. And so we want to continue this in Matthew 26. We're going to read verses 43 to 44. It says, when he came back, he again found them sleeping again. because their eyes were heavy. Unbelievable. Daylight savings? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so he left them and went away once more and prayed A the third, third time. time, saying the same thing. Wow. So Jesus didn't just pray one time. He didn't pray two times. It shows us here that he prayed three times. He was pressed in the garden. And you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that Jesus chose the Garden of Gethsemane to experience his moment of deepest grief and pain. You know, Gethsemane was an olive garden. It was, a, it was a grove of olives. And the word Gethsemane means a place of pressing. Mm. A place of pressing. I think the olive tree is such a beautiful picture of why our hearts must go through crushing times. I learned a lot about the olive that was studying this. And did you know that the olive, the fruit, the olive, is naturally bitter? It's a naturally bitter fruit. And in order for it to even be useful, it needs to grow through a specific process. It's not like an apple or, you know, a cherry or tomato that you just grab from the tree. It needs to go through a specific process. And so in order for it to even be edible, it has to go through this process. So let me tell you a little bit about this process. First, it needs to be washed. And by the way, you can't just harvest an olive and just grab it from the tree. In order for, it's such a hard fruit that it needs to have experienced hours of rain so that it's soaked with water and that it's, it's, it's soft enough for you to even be able to harvest it, right? So first you harvest it, then you have to wash it, and then it needs to be broken. After being broken, it needs to be soaked. Many times they soak it in vinegar and water, and many times it goes through a process of salting, and then there's waiting. There's a lot of waiting. It's a lengthy process because it needs to be cured from its bitterness. Mm. And I think in the same way, our hearts need to allow God to take us through a process of healing when we experience loss and pain and grief. And what, we, what happens if we don't, if we try to skip it, if we try to deny it, if we try to ignore it, we're gonna remain bitter. Mm. Our hearts are going to remain hard and bitter. But God loves us so much that he doesn't want us to remain there. He wants to say, hey, I'm with you through this process. I'm going to walk with you through this process. I'm going to work with you. I'm going to work with your heart. 
And you know something beautiful about the olive? The best way to preserve an olive for a long time is to press or even crush it so that you can extract oil. This fruit, the most valuable part of this fruit is not the pulp, right, that you eat, but it's the actual oil that it produces. I want you to think about that. The most valuable part of this fruit wow. is the oil that happens only when it's gone through this whole process and it is crushed Gosh. and it is pressed. The same is true for us. Many times it feels as if we are being pressed on every side, even crushed. But I want you to remember that this pressing, that this crushing is not the end. There is a purpose in this pain. Yeah. There is a perfect purpose in, this, in this anguish, in this pressing. God has a purpose. He wants to do something so beautiful in you and I. Something so valuable that will come out of this that more valuable than if we skip the process. I want to read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 to 10. It says, we are hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. Amen. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Yeah. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. You know, as I think of Jesus in the garden and I think of the pressing that he went through, as hard as it was, as hard as it was to face the betrayal, as hard as it was to suffer the torture, as hard as it was to face the cross, to carry the weight of sin, there was purpose in the pressing. Amen. And on the other side of the garden, on the other side of the cross, was the oil. The oil, which is a symbolism of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And you may be in your garden in your Gethsemane right now in your life, going through some pressing. But let me tell you, it's important because the pressing gets rid of the bitterness. That's right. If you don't go through it, the bitterness stays. It's bottled up. It'll begin leaking out. We follow Jesus' example. For us to mature and grow emotionally and spiritually, we must allow God to teach us through our losses to coach us through our suffering and to hold our hand as we walk through grief, through the wall, through the dark night of the soul. We need to see him at work in the hard moments because we love the oil, but sometimes we resist the process. God's invitation to us is to persevere with him, to allow the hardness in our hearts to be broken to allow him to mold us and shape us. And I'm here to tell you, it's not fun. Grief, pain, loss, it's not that we want it. We're not saying, Lord, give us more. But we are saying, when it comes, Lord, we're ready because we got you. And if I'm in it, Lord, forgive me for, for not submitting and surrendering, for not paying attention to it for not trusting you and listening to you. I, I, wanna, I wanna pay attention to it. I wanna bring my pain. I wanna bring my people. I wanna bring my prayers and process it with you, Lord. I wanna wait well in the confusing in between yeah. by trusting you, believing in you, by surrendering everything to you and saying not my will but your will be done and by listening to what you say, your prescription, your advice, your help. And Lord, may that lead me to a place where I break through and now the old gives birth to Amen. the new. And so I'm praying for the oil of the Holy Spirit in your life. But the oil can't come without the crushing right. and the pressing. But the pressing is not without purpose. God is growing us and he is maturing us. Amen. I want to do two prayers. The second one I'm going to pray for anybody who's far from God and needs to 
accept Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. But this first prayer, can you pray just for, for anybody who's going through the garden right now? And that's a good question to end on. What is Jesus teaching you in your garden right now in this season? What has he taught you in the garden? Can you just pray for, yeah. for the process? Let's yeah. pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your presence right now. And we thank you, God, because you remind us today that you hear us, Lord. You hear our cries. You see our hearts. Lord, you love us so much, Lord, that you allow us, Lord, to experience hard things, painful things. But we need your help, Lord, to walk through these, these moments, Lord, these seasons. Lord, I, I don't know every situation in this room or anybody watching online, God, but you see each and every one of us. God, you know us by name, and you see the condition of our hearts, the condition of our souls. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone going through a season right now of grief and loss and pain and disillusion, God, I pray that they would hold on to your hand, God. Yeah. I pray that they would not try to deny it mm -hmm. or try to mask it or suppress it, Lord, but they would be honest. Lord, first with themselves and then with you, God. And they would allow you and trust you to walk you through this season, Lord. Lord, your word says that you are the good shepherd. A good shepherd that promises to never leave us and to walk with us through the darkest valley. Yes. And I pray, Lord, if there's anyone walking through that valley right now, God, that they would know that they are not alone. Mm. God, that you are that good shepherd that leads us to green pastures and to still waters. Amen. That they would not give up in the middle of that valley, God, but they would hold on to your hand. That they would wait on you, listen to you, trust in you. Lord, and I pray that they would know that there is purpose, Father, in the moments of pain in this life. And they also remind us that this was never intended to be our home. Our home is with you, God. And in this, in heaven, when we are with you, Lord, there will be no more pain. There will be no more tears. Yeah. There will be no more suffering, God. And so we thank you for that promise. Yes. Because it is through the blood of Jesus that we can have that assurance. And so I thank you, Lord, because I know that you are working, you are speaking to us. Yes, Lord. And I just pray that that word that you had for each person, Lord, that we would receive it and that we would not just like listen to it today and walk out unchanged, but that we would apply it to the deepest part of our hearts and, and allow you to continue that work in us, Father. We trust you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.